Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today on how to embrace content at a global enterprise. Uh, I want to thank all of you for showing up and I want to thank our speakers for uh, arriving today as well and giving us some great lessons about this really tricky topic. Um, content marketing is clearly something that's hot at companies of all size, um, but companies that have a kind of global reach and a global audience can struggle with some pretty sticky particulars. And so we really want to deal with those today, you know, the companies that have reach across not only North America, not only uh, the UK, not only Europe, but all over the world. So um, I'm really happy that we can present some of these best practices from people like Kyle Lacey and Carlos Abler. But just real quickly, let me give you an introduction to myself. My name is Jesse Noyes, and I'm the Senior Director of Content Marketing at Capost. Uh, so what that means is I manage the overall content practice here. So uh, everything from eBooks and infographics to website and uh, email, lead nurturing, all those types of things that we use content for, uh, I'm overseeing. So uh, I have a great team here, and I really, uh, as someone who markets to other content marketers, I have a pretty meta job pretty geeky job that I really love. Um, and that enables me to work with some of the speakers that we have today, the uh, caliber speakers like Kyle. Um, Kyle is the head of uh, global content marketing and research at the Salesforce Exact Target Marketing Cloud. Try saying that six times fast. His team is responsible for the strategy, production, and activation of content and marketing research in seven countries. So he clearly knows this subject really well. He is also the author of three books, uh, Twitter Marketing for Dummies, Social CR, uh, CRM for Dummies, and Branding Yourself. So if you're a dummy, then uh, Kyle is really your man. Uh, I also want to introduce Carl Abler. Um, Carl uh, is the leader of the online content strategy at 3M, where he helps achieve content excellence across all dimensions of publica publication operations. So content and online utility creation, management, distribution, governance, measurement and optimization. Uh, so you probably can relate, uh, a lot of you who are joining from global enterprises can relate to a lot of these challenges. He implements a program that scales to any organizational level from empowering a product portfolio manager strategic planning to division subsidiary uh, CMO road mapping and a multi-year track of content competence to business group leadership's need to cultivate multi-division onboarding to needs that transcend business structure altogether. So, quite the expert. So uh, we're really excited to have both Kyle and uh, Carlos talking today. Uh, but before we jump in, I want to do a little bit of housekeeping first. Uh, the hashtag for today's webinar is global content. So if you have any feedback or anything you want to share on Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, please try to use the hashtag so we can keep track of those conversations and be sure to respond. Um, if you have questions, we are going to try to answer questions today at the end of our webinar, near the end of the session, and I'll be posing some of these directly to Kyle and Carlos. Um, there's a chat feature down in the left-hand corner of your uh, webinar UI there. Uh, please feel free to use it. And then the last rule is really just have fun. So try to sit back, relax, take this moment uh, in your busy workday to hear some best practices, some uh, great experience, and enjoy. So before I kick it over to uh, Kyle, I wanted to talk a little bit about why we're even addressing this particular subject. Well, the big thing is everyone is doing content marketing, right? You see the same stats that I've probably seen, that 91% or 92% of B2Bs are doing content marketing. 94% of B2Cs are doing content marketing. So clearly, content marketing is a hot subject, and it's something that people care a lot about. However, there's a difference between doing content marketing and doing content marketing right. And so I really want to talk about the difference between doing and doing it right. So one of the stats I wanted to point to was this, uh, you know, 52% of enterprise marketers plan to increase content marketing spend. So that was a survey that was taken last year about, uh, you know, this particular year. Um, so clearly a lot of the enterprise sees the value of producing content marketing because they're putting their budgets there. But at the same time, 32% of those enterprise marketers even consider themselves effective at this. So that really brings up the question, why the gap? If so much money is now going into content marketing at the enterprise level, if we're clearly making an investment there, then why are we having such a hard time actually measuring or even feeling effective? 
Well, I have some theories on this. Uh, the number one theory I have is that marketing has traditionally been organized around product lines, channels, and regions. And that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, product lines make a lot of sense. If you have multiple product lines, you're selling uh, multiple different versions of your product or your service, then you're probably going to organize a lot of your marketing teams around those different product lines to push those products. Similarly, channels just keep fragmenting and getting a wider set of them, and they're larger all the time. We, we started out with the Internet, and next thing you knew, with social media, we're all over the place. So people are really trying to organize around the channel. And at the same time, people are also trying to organize around regions. So you might have a marketing department that's centralized, um, but you might also have a marketing department that's you know, centered for that particular region in which you're selling your product. This is, makes a lot of sense. I mean, if you're at a global enterprise, you're thinking about all these things uh, constantly. But one of the problems it creates is that all this content then gets created in these individual silos. People are creating content to help sell one product, they're creating content to fill up their channel, or they're creating content to reach one particular region. And as a result, the content is a bit disorganized. So I just wanted to point to some of the, re some of the uh, impact of this, the results of this way of structuring our content. 72% of marketers don't have a unified content creation process today. So as I said, when you start creating content in individual silos, the content doesn't provide a unified experience for the buyer. And so as a result, the buyer goes through a kind of difficult, if not discordant, journey. At the same time, 83% of marketers say that buyer-centric content is a priority, right? They clearly see that they need to get off talking just about their product and talk about the needs and desires of the buyer. But only 23% said they're at an advanced stage of actually creating buyer-centric content. And that's because it's really hard to create buyer-centric content when you are trying to create content for one particular product or for multiple products or you're in a different region and you don't have that unified creation, pro uh, creation process. And then 47% of marketers say they create content just to fill up channels. You know, this just came out from Forrester and it was really startling. That's almost half of the marketers they talk to. Half of the marketers within these large enterprises are just pushing content to channels. They've got a channel they need to manage, and so they're going to go and create the content, whether they get it from a centralized, uh, a centralized team or they get it through a unified process. One way or another, they've got to fill up that channel. And lastly, 60% of enterprise marketers say lack of integration uh, across marketing is a challenge. This is the biggest ch challenge when it comes to content marketing within a global enterprise. So clearly, we're having a problem finding a way to get our teams together to have a centralized focus and a centralized way of creating our content, distributing our content, and analyzing it. And so here's the takeaway. What happens then? 60 to 70% of content goes unused. So that's a, 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 a stat from Serious Decisions, which talks to a lot of different enterprise-level uh, marketers all over the world. And what they find is that all this content is being created. It's ending up in landfills. It's ending up in the trash can all because the content has very limited usage. It's made for one channel, it's made for one product, or it's made for one region. And so it gets used maybe one time, maybe two, twice if you're lucky, and then never, it, it's just not visible. No one can find it. No one knows where to put it. So as a result, a lot of content landfills are being built. So I've outlined the problem today uh, and not really painted the prettiest picture, uh, but I believe that Kyle and Carlos are going to be able to give us a lot of help into how to solve these problems so that we're not finding our content in the trash can as well. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kyle Lacey over at Exact Target. Kyle, take it away. Thanks, Jesse. Thank you all of you for joining. Um, I wanted to start, and then we're going to get to Carlos because Carlos is going to draw the huge picture of global demand. Um, I'm going to start with our team with, at the Exact Target Marketing Cloud. I have a team of 11 based in Indianapolis, and our main focus is demand gen as well as brand authority. So I wanted to show you our vision statement because I, I think it kind of sets the, the um, landscape of what we're going to talk about. We drive demand and brand authority by inspiring digital marketers through primary research and engaging content. And the one thing that I want to show is that primary research side of it. But when I'm talking to my team and when we're building our strategy and we're trying to figure out what to do from quarter to quarter, every 90 days we, we try to switch up our strategy, we always go to this image. Um, and for those of you who don't know what this is, this is from a guy named Seth Castile out of California, uh, a photographer. And he was trying to figure out how to make 
as ends meet, right? In the world where Instagram filters and five-year-olds can be photographers, basically. Um, so he bought, he took all of his money that he had left, and he bought an uh, underwater digital camera. And he actually took a picture of his dog jumping into a pool, which you see here. A very common thing that happens, right, for dogs. And he thought, huh, this is kind of funny. So he put it online, and his friend said, oh, yeah, this is a little funny, right? If you look at it, you can't help but laugh, honestly. And uh, the friends put it on Reddit, and the picture went viral. And I hope that none of us are going to talk about things going viral today because that's frankly stupid. But his actually worked, sold hundreds of photos of this dog, and you can pretty much guess what he does now, which is takes pictures of dogs jumping into pools. He travels the globe taking pictures of dogs underwater. There's a coffee table book, Dogs Underwater. There are calendars. Um, Jesse and I are going to talk after where we're going to – create a Kickstarter campaign where we're going to do Cats Underwater. And Carlos, you can jump in on this as well. It can be a Compose 3M uh, marketing cloud thing. Um, but what Carlos did, which is how my team tries to look at content, was he took advantage of a moment in time and benefited his personal brand, right? A very common moment of time, a dog jumping into a pool, a dog frankly having fun, right? And the same thing applies to how you're producing content. And You've seen this 150 times. It is a life cycle model. There are my billion different versions of this life cycle model. But it's usually what a customer or prospect walks through when they are evaluating purchasing your service or product from awareness to advocacy. And every single point along this life cycle is a different touch point, a different experience that somebody's having with you. And we need to get to the point as communicators, marketers, brand, um, brand communicators. We need to get to the point where we're designing systems and writing content that delivers this in a personalized perspective to every single individual that's interacting with you. So my team sprinkles in throughout this entire process for the exact target marketing cloud. But I really wanted to show you exactly how we build that from a global perspective. But I wanted to give you a better idea of how we look at content. And we look at content in regards to moments matter and how does, does content build into the journey that the person is taking with your brand. And we really focus on three things, which is primary research, which is more of our global perspective, brand journalism, and video. Um, so I have writers on my team, designers, editors, and videographers, and all of that funnels into our web properties and social properties. Um, and the whole point is to do top of the funnel research and content that drives more interaction and more brand authority around the exact target marketing cloud, and ultimately around Salesforce. Um, so within those properties, we, we try to look at content pillars. And I, I, do, I do believe in the process of planning, and I do believe in the process of setting up personas, but I don't believe it 100% of the time. I think it's okay from a strategic perspective to try to plan things from a, from a global landscape. But frankly, you can plan as much as you want, but things are going to change on a weekly basis, especially in the space that we're in, um, in, the, in the marketing technology world. But these are the pillars, and then we weight those content pillars based off of the importance that that content plays into the overall demand from, uh, for the company. And I'll get into the metrics after this. And then it gives the description. I think it's important to do this because I think it gives your team a better idea of what type of content they should be producing. But our number one producing a piece is primary research. And this is what really helps us scale globally. It doesn't necessarily help us scale from a budgetary perspective because the more countries you add to a research project, the more the cost, especially if you're doing panels in different countries like Germany and France and the UK, um, but we try to do all of our research, everything that we produce in-house, we try to do research. We also do the thought leadership papers with Forrester and Gartner, and that's the other side of primary. But I have a marketing research manager on my team, and she's the one that handles all of the analysis from a global perspective in terms of research. Primary research drives 10 times more leads and pipe over all other content that we produce. And it's important to remember that because 
you can reproduce the 10 steps to a great content marketing team or the 5 steps to be a great salesperson or the 20 things to do if you're bored on a weekend, and it's not your content. It's just regurgitated. Primary research allows you to push from a PR perspective. It allows you to scale globally because you could do research in each country. We have a uh, report called the State of Marketing Report that we released in January, and we have one coming up um, launching again in January 2015, and we're going to scale that across countries instead of just focusing on the U.S. You could produce the same report with 10 countries in it, and then you can produce 10 separate reports for each country. So it's important to remember that primary research from a demand perspective and from a PR perspective drives the most interactions when it comes to what we do. There's four types of primary research that we focus on as a, as a company. Benchmark, co-branded research, like we would do a, for example, we would do a research report a research report with Compost and publish it. Consumer-based, every time we launch an office, we do a consumer-based research report over how consumers in that area use technology, especially because that's what our B2C and B2B clients actually care about, right? Uh, so for example, we launched a Japanese consumer insights report when we launched our office in Tokyo in April. 2,100 Japanese consumers, how do they think about social, mobile, and email? And then peer research, which is surveying marketers to try to figure out what your plans are for 2014. And we really try to build all of our strategic direction around primary research because the churn and burn of steps in eBooks are important, but I, I really think the research to an extent can be easy to get and it's good from a global perspective. And this is just one example. Our subscribers, fans, and followers series is something that's been around at Exact Target uh, for six or seven years, started by Jeff Roars. And uh, this is just the Japanese report that we launched. Another way to scale globally, other than primary research, is brand journalism. And I don't mean brand journalism in regards to going and hiring journalists. I do think this is an argument just in the content world in general. I do think that it's a good thing um, sometimes to hire journalists, and I do think that from a writing perspective, it's really good. But brand journalism in my world uh, from a global scale is news jacking as well as creating content that is applicable to the marketer that we're trying to sell to instead of just crap content. Um, we do this in six different blogs, four different, um, four different languages. This is the UK, France, Germany, Brazil, and the US. Um, I think I got all those. And uh, what we do is that we publish off, we use the Compose platform of course, but each marketing manager within each country manages the content production of the blog. We fill the holes with um, translation. So we might, if Germany releases legislation on, um, on um, no follow or an email campaign, email opt-ins, or any type of other legal, legalese that might affect our customers, or even for example, the Gmail new, the new inbox design for Gmail. We'll write a post and then get it translated to each type of um, language, to each language. And it helps us scale. But brand journalism is really about researching content and then writing about it. And the, the posts that get the most shares and most traffic and just overall the most stuff um, is most stuff, you know what I mean, in terms of metrics, is the stuff that has to do with content that is valuable. This is probably one of our most shared posts, which is 30 Most Genius Content Marketing Examples of 2014. It was research done by one of my writers that had to do with um, just people doing good work. And I think that's really what brand journalism is about. The other side of that is um, interviews and being able to build out interviews with thought leaders, which we are moving into. And we can scale that because we can do that for people that actually um, are in separate countries, right? And we scale it by allowing marketing managers or marketing consultants to write and even contractors to write. Uh, we have about 100 writers that are employees of the Marketing Cloud on the Compose platform. And it allows us just to scale because they are constantly um, creating content that's for their geo, for their channel, um, and it's not 
all the time my riders producing content. And then the last thing is content personalization. Uh, this is something that we do as Exact Target, and um, it basically means that personalizing content based off of preferences and, and browsing behavior and clicks and just tracking what people do. And we know from an extent of just personalized content is that people buy more when things are personalized. Amazon effect, if you uh, buy something from Amazon and they personalize your content for you, whether that's in a cart or in a transactional email, a triggered message, we try to do that from a blogging perspective and a content perspective on our website. And personalization of content by preference and geo is essential to any global content strategy. So if you go to our French website and you go to our German blog and you're reading a blog about email and you're on the German blog, the CTA, the click, the call to action, the banner, actually it will be an email deliver, deliverable in German. So everything is personalized based off of what somebody is reading. In the near future, the sidebar, the bottom of the website, even the content on the main page will change based off of browsing behavior, which is predictive intelligence depending on uh, what country you are in. It's a, it's a product of ours called predictive intelligence. But you could go to the blog and see this in action. We've actually tested from a banner perspective that text banners instead of image banners actually perform better and the ones below the fold actually perform better than the ones above the fold. So if you go to the blog, usually you can see that different things are personalized, call to actions are personalized based off of people's reading behavior rather than I just think that we need to market this ebook and that's scaled globally. Um, the thing to remember and what we've kind of checked, which is the metrics that I'll get into and then pass it to Carlos, is when we change our banners to be personalized based off of where the person is from, lo location, to what they are reading, we saw over a six month period of time about 1,000% increase in click lead. So people want personalization, and I think we know that, and I think it's just going to get more um, in that realm as we move towards a more global economy um, and more towards what we do as a business. So let's look at metrics real fast. I think it helps when it comes to scaling, and I'm going to pass it to Carlos. Uh, we do two types of metrics, intangible and tangible. Intangible, I, don't, I put like secondary emphasis on visits, uh, influence of business, social influence, um, page views, downloads, and percentage of overall website traffic. This is engagement numbers. It's good to see in terms of trends. It's not actually driving business. Right? Time on site is more of a tangible thing. Page views could be in the middle. It's really depending on how you're tracking it, and then click throughs to the website. Tangible is closed business. Was our content the direct source of closed business through sales? Direct sourced pipe. How much are we driving in regards to pipe for the sales? For sales, right? So pipe means how much is available for sales to actually sell, um, and that's really the main point of all of marketing in terms of a demand gen standpoint. Referrals to the website, clicks to the website that, that resulted in a requested demo or resulted in some type of lead form complete, and then net new leads. So if somebody comes to a lead form from the blog or from any place to download a piece of content, and they're a net new person within our database, I rank that much higher than some of the intangible things that we do. And we do this by country. Um, when we're building our, our uh, reporting every quarter so that we can try to see what's actually improving. And I think that from a demand gen standpoint, this works for us because it allows us to personalize some of this. Um, so the one thing I want you to keep in mind, and then I'm going to pass it to Carlos, and this is one of my favorite quotes. I heard it last year. David Walmsley said it at a, at a retail conference. He's the head of multi-channel for Marks and Spencer. We must move from numbers keeping score to numbers that drive better actions. And it's up to us as marketers, as communicators, as brand advocates to not only keep score, like I don't know, however you want to keep score in terms of your goals, but drive better actions for everybody within the organization because content is at the forefront of all of it, whether you're an email marketer or a brand advocate. And with that, I will turn it over to Carlos. Hey, thanks a lot. That was, that was really great. Um, 
So hello, everyone. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, so my name is Carlos Abler. I'm leader of online content strategy at 3M. Um, and so for those who aren't familiar with 3M beyond Post-it notes and Scotch tape and whatnot, we're um, a company that, that has you know, 46 core technologies in, in our organization, which we permute uh, for solutions for you know, really a, kind of an, a nearly infinite range of uh, product potential. We're um, in many ways an ingredient brand where you know, may have several products in your cell phone or in your computer. And so we're kind of in everything. We're um, a complicated company. We're in over 70 countries. We have 38 international countries with manufacturing operations and 35 with laboratories. And we're, uh, we have 30, um, over 30 divisions and are in really just about every market there is and just about every kind of selling model there is. So we're a very complex organization. We have a marketing community of somewhere around 6,000 people. We have somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 products. Nobody has any idea. Um, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty interesting place to, uh, uh, to try to drive content excellence. It's a very fascinating place with a lot of opportunity. Um, so my role here is kind of a, a bit at a meta level. Um, so I don't you know, directly run a content team producing content. My role is to help us spawn content teams globally. So. Um, um, you know, I'm not responsible for producing very specific strategies and campaigns and whatnot, but it's more around enabling the organization to be able to do that. Um, one of the things I often say is that successful, a successful content initiative can't spawn more successful initiatives. Um, for organizations like this, you need a generative model to be able to uh, deploy and scale. And that's, that's really what my current focus is in the organization. So, um, you know, I think many of us have had this experience. You know, we we you know we're in a web we're at, uh, on a panel at conferences and whatnot, and someone always ends up asking, "What's the single most important thing you need to do in order to ensure the success of content, or what's the single greatest obstacle?" And and uh, um, you know, and very often people will kind of go to a place of saying, "Oh, you know, if uh, only we could get executives on board and leadership support, then you know, content mana would rain down from heaven and everyone would be happy and and all of that sort of thing." But I think a lot of these um, uh, these kinds of statements are are radically oversimplified. Um, Really, I think that the content war is one that's fought on many fronts and many fronts simultaneously. So certainly leadership support is important, but it's almost like a, a table with a whole lot of legs. But if any leg falls out, the whole table goes. Um, and so what you're seeing here is kind of a list of what you know, we think some of the essential enablers are. And we really have to think about addressing these things on a parallel path. Um, because you may, for example, be forming a, a coalition of people among divis divisions or more at granular product ownership levels that ultimately bubble up and, and create more demand um, for things like leadership support to essentially you know, kind of gather the masses to compel influences. Or on the other end, you might have leadership initiatives that really um, depend on, on content or, or can't get anywhere if, if uh, some of the essential infrastructure and support isn't there. So um, there's just a, a lot of ways that, you know, as, as we all know, content is the blood that flows through every organ of the organization. Um, you know, there's just a, a lot of enablers and being able to address all of these things simultaneously is really kind of the best path forward. It's a little bit like a game of Go, if you're familiar with it, where you, you know, put stones, you know, on, on the grid and, and various uh, distant from one another locations in order to ultimately surround the enemy and win. And that's, that's a lot of what it's like, I, I believe, to uh, work on, on content in organizations, especially large uh, matrix organizations. So what we're going to talk about here is, uh, you know, we're just going to be able to touch on several of what um, we found to be some of the essential ingredients to really help transform our culture. Um, so, and you'll, you'll be able to have access to this deck later so you can meditate it on more detail. I need to kind of fly over it relatively quickly. And, um, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end and whatnot. So, um, but anyway, so one essential thing is, is to have a content vision that's linked to organizational strategy and vision. So in our case, you know, we have a corporate strategy, we have a corporate vision. And so one of the things we did is create a content vision that actually uh, uh, leverages the messaging and shows how the content vision is going to directly enable the um, uh, directly enable 
the strategic and, and visionary goals. And if you're lucky enough like we are to have things like um, expanding relevance to customers and presence in the marketplace as, as core strategies, um, there are many ways, as, as you know, probably people on the call are well aware, of how uh, content really supports relevance. And one of the, the thought leadership kind of mental model shifts that I try to help the organization make is understanding that one of the reasons why we call content marketing content marketing is because we actually are marketing a product when we put the content out. So to start to think about, um, just like you think about your product strategically and, and what, you know, what, what uh, value does it deliver to a, a person, what needs and goals does it facilitate, um, what are all the strategic inputs to it, you know, how are you, um, you know, delivering it in the channel and thinking about your channel strategy as a unified whole and integrated marketing and all that sort of thing, a lot of that same type of logic and even some of the same research inputs go into that. So it's really a, a parallel product path. And that's something that, that I found that really resonates with marketers. But in any case, I, I tend to say that, that you know, the number one way we deliver value to, three, uh, value to customers in the world is through our products and services. The number two way is through content. So um, I feel empowered to make a lot of bold statements about content because of that, that roll-up to uh, strategy. It's also important to have a kind of a manifesto of the vision of the type of organization that you want to become. So one of the ways that I frame that is in some critical questions. And here, and I won't read them all at you right now, but um, you know, I, I, I believe if your organization can answer these 13 critical questions that you will have a solid content foundation. And they touch on segment segmentation and targeting and high value topics and solid editorial planning that embraces agility. Um, uh, you know, like, like Kyle was talking about a moment ago around planning, but having that flexibility as well. Um, business objective fulfillment at all customer lifecycle stages. There's a whole kind of series of things here. And so if you think about, okay, what are the questions? If we have answers for them, we will be where we need to be. That's a good kind of, I think, a kind of document and statement to, to have people bounce, sort of self-assess themselves against. Um, and then I, I think it's, I've also found it very helpful to have an elevator pitch length definition of what content strategy is and that you know, people might actually remember and it's composed of elements that people typically forget. Now, you know, for those of us who have been in content strategy and marketing for a while, we know there's a, a deluge of definitions out there that have various combinations of input, throughput, and output as a part of what they are. And to some extent, a lot of them reflect that slide we were looking at you know, two slides ago with the 13 uh, things. You know, um, People, you know, bring in, you know, uh, production-related stuff. You know, uh, just just a lot of inputs into into them. Um, and I've got kind of this simple model of thinking about it that I found actually to be pretty helpful. That's just composed of a mission, target, and goal. Now, when we actually do the work, you know, obviously we're into you know many, many more inputs than this. It gets more complex than this. But this has been really helpful because, you know, if you think about these three very, fairly simple things, which is you know the mission being this valuable content that we're delivering, and the target being the people we're delivering it to. And specifically, the content needs to address the needs and goals of those people in some way or, or another. And I always tie everything to what is the customer's needs and goals? How is this helping them, their, their needs and goals, and always tying it to that. And so long as that, and that is what defines the value of that valuable content. And then you've got your goals, the outcomes that you want from that, which you know, prongs out into customer-related and business-related goals, you know, increase sales, decrease sales cycle time, and all that sort of thing, but also customer goals of, you know, are they more efficient at whatever it is you're trying to make them more efficient at? Did they get it fixed? Are they, you know, all the customer satisfaction related kinds of things or customer empowerment sort of things that we do through the utility of our content? But it, it, as simple as this is, it's actually been pretty critical because it's amazing how often people will forget one or more of these simple things. You'll go into the business and you'll, you know, you'll ask them, what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? And people will come back with, um, you know, with non-quantifiable goals all the time. And then that gets you know, hard to really tie that to the, the metrics of, uh, you know, of the outcomes you're looking for. If you know, for example, 10,000 blog subscribers might get you the 1,500 sales you need and whatnot if people don't have numbers to work against. So people forget that kind of stuff all the time. And, and, and other things start to drive people's decisions in organizations organizations all the time that forget about the customer and forget about the business. And this is, this is a universal thing. Um, you'll see things like what your IT can handle start to drive what, your con what content you put out or how you put out or when you put it out. And so all sorts of things start to weigh into, you know, or, or um, 
uh, you know, really challenging timeline-related projects that don't have, um, you know, time for strategic inputs and all that sort of thing. So a lot of stuff starts to pull people away from these, uh, pull people away from these three factors. So it's it's nice to have something simple to point to um, when talking about these things versus like a giant edict or, you know, some process diagram kind of like is in the background of this slide. So another thing that was helpful for us was to uh, develop an end-to-end -end life cycle management framework for content. And um, this is basically cradle to grave life cycle of, of the content. And this has been really helpful for us because as we all know, trying to drive content transformation in an organization, it requires a lot of investment in human resources and technology and process and all of this sort of thing. And having some sort of framework that you can point to to show gaps is really critical. So, you know, being it, so if you have, for example, a lot of companies have content management systems that are really more kind of on the, on the, you know, further down the funnel end of content. Um, uh, you know, they're more delivery management systems like web content management or social tools and, and, and PIM systems and other things that are really about the, the output they're delivering to and not necessarily about things like production management and, and where you storing your persona information? How are you uh, getting to that? Like, like Compost, for example, is something that um, that uh, strikes at that you know more upstream kind of phase. So, um, you know, so that was a smart place to play for them because a lot of organizations that are trying to get up and running as uh, content production organizations, but aren't aren't that they aren't already news organizations or whatever really tend to need a lot of help around that upstream area so having some sort of framework um, that you can point to to show those things so that when leadership is saying hey we really want this from you by this or that time you can keep saying well we really could do it if you'd get that part of the you know that that weak link in the chain fixed you know what I mean so this has been really very helpful for us to have something like this Next, and this is kind of the big one, is um, we've created a, a fully productized content marketing deployment framework that's made up out of five pillars, content operations, preparation work for strategic input, uh, workshopping process, um, a, a basically a, a campaign or initiative type of architecting and producing uh, process, and then a deployment and optimization. So this is essentially a checklist of activities for which we have tools and workshops and whatnot to help actually now propagate this capability within the organization. And this framework serves our various levels of the organization. So here we're seeing, you know, executive leadership at the top. We're seeing, you know, um, um, corporate uh, centers of excellence in, in that second row. Um, we're seeing, you know, business services, which in large complex organizations can have, um, you know, global and regional and even country level manifestations. Um, we have business group structures, you know, which could be global um, business groups, global divisions, and country level divisions. And then we've got, you know, a lot of the, you know, boots on the ground people who touch content and touch the customer in, in, in some phase or another throughout their life cycle, um, such as marketing, sales support, corporate communications, you know, PR, HR, uh, other sorts of uh, uh, folks like that who are, are less HR, they're more in that upper level, but, you know, the, the, the more the business uh, um, uh, customer purchasing life cycle folks. So, um, so our, our program addresses leadership. It helps um, leadership identify direction, you know, direction for transforming roles and departments into agile marketing organizations. It's really key for us to you know, under, help leadership understand that content isn't just this extra thing, that content is you know, content marketing, content strategy. These are intrinsic marketing practices in the 21st century in the digital space. Content mediates every single touch point we have, whether it's someone speaking or someone reading something or getting help. There isn't really any engagement that I can think of um, that doesn't in some way involve content. And so really helping people understand that. Also, um, you know, what are the infrastructure solutions we should be investing in, like I was alluding to a moment ago? What are pilot investment initiatives? Where, where do we need top-down pressure when we need it? So our framework helps leadership with that. Um, and then also, the, you know, if you think about your corporate centers of excellence, your, your you know, human resources and your, your marketing practice centers of excellence, your sales practice, all these different center of excellence type of organizations, it's very important to drive collaboration between them because their collaboration at the top or in the center does definitely cascade out into the organization because these departments tend to be reflected um, in microcosm, you know, uh, out in the company. So it's very key that in the center that, that the silos are, are 
are you know are broken down when it comes to concepts of market ownership, concepts of uh, concepts of customer ownership, and uh, how we you know manage content. You know, so there's the sharing of assets, there's alignments of strategy and message, there's unified knowledge management. That's very key. You know, you don't want to get into a lot of redundant you know insights creation that are done for one-off kinds of things. You want some knowledge management around that that's delivered and shared across and cascades down into where people are actually doing work and supposed to be applying that stuff, um, you know, which can happen both in a product development context as well as the content development context. Um, you want to align disciplinary competencies too. And this is a really interesting one because these corporate COEs tend to oversee disciplinary competencies like sales, center of excellence will be in charge of what that means for sales and marketing for marketing and so on. So one of the th exercises we've been doing is showing how content actually is its own areas of competency, but at that it weaves through these um, other areas. So for example, if part of your sales force's area of competency is to be more customer savvy and deliver that intel back cross-functionally to the organization, that's something that should be making its way into your persona management. That's something that should be making its way into, okay, what's the helpful content we could be delivering for people who sales actually has you know, physical contact with every day, right? So um, um, both in sales and marketing, there are um, synergetic, you know, mutually empowering uh, uh, areas of competency that can be tied together by content practices. And so this has been really helpful to be able to highlight some of those types of things. And then next, you know, we serve the business services entities. And especially in big organizations where you've got a lot of divisional or product siloing uh, going on in relation to the customer. Um, often it may be these sort of services organizations that cross over the various silos that are the places where uh, more strategic customer or market focused kind of content initiatives start to organically emerge, even if, that, if their original purpose may have been more IT oriented or uh, some other type of services. So you know, we like to help to accelerate organically emerging content services there. There's train the trainer, processes and tools, providing them with the technology and platform, and all of that sort of thing are all um, key for that level of the organization. And then, of course, now we're into you know, global and country divisions with our platforms and tools and processes and strategic guidance, and then um, nurturing the champions in the business from, and they can emerge everywhere. I mean, you'll, people will come to me from marketing, from Marcoms, from business development, sales, customer care. It's amazing. I mean, people come from, kind of from all over. And like that game of Go I was talking about earlier, you want to you know, try to uh, uh, leverage you know, all of these leaders and, and, and help you know, help link them up. Um, and then we conduct a lot of, uh, a big part of our framework is, is uh, collaborative workshops, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit more in a moment. So focusing on some of these uh, pillars here. So under content operations, it's really important to have a framework and a plan really for everything. Like really get futuristic, figure out what the future organization would look like if you were in charge of the whole entire universe and had all the money in the world and everyone just said yes and obeyed everything you said what would you do? And it's really important to, as you can, develop those visions because it's important to have an answer for everything, if you can. Now, I, I know that's ambitious, but you really want to try to do that. So what we're seeing here are tiny little examples of poster-sized diagrams about, um, about the future state. And eventually they come around and they need it. So it's good to have it um, when the, the opportunity comes versus trying to create something like that um, once it's asked for. Um, and also it gives you the opportunity to try to push it. Um, next, you know, is, is really key in help, and part of that, at least in, in these large organizations, is helping people how to align around market. So if you've got these big markets you try to serve, how do you get global and regional and, and, and area level um, people all synced up so that you can do things like coherently address them and optimize your assets? So when do you create something globally that should be globally created and localized versus assets that are local only versus locally created assets that turn out to be globally relevant? Um, that can circulate back into the global pool, right? So achieving this kind of holy grail, kind of snake eating its tail scenario is kind of a vision of where everyone would love to be. And um, um, so that's what we're trying to support. So 
Um, you know, I, I, you know, we have tools together for this. It's really important to have tools. Um, a lot of the key ones we use are really for the preparation work, gathering our persona info, all our intel that's going to basically, um, you know, around uh, targeting what customer goals and pain points are, what are their various tasks you know, related information, communication, commerce, and utility, what are business goals, what are key market inputs, getting all that kind of strategic stuff, and then start running workshops with it. So, um, you know, here we're seeing uh, a person who's part of a team who's been um, um, doing a workshop where the, the yellow post-it notes correspond to uh, tactics that are now in an actual customer decision journey that may be taking them throughout their, the, the life cycle. Um, the blue post-it notes are, are, are links between them, and then the, the, the future ones are the, the um, the SLAs and the data that's been generated and all that kind of stuff uh, on the backside that happens um, as people are transitioning from one phase to another and whatnot. So we, we basically do these workshops to help empower people to be able to uh, do these sorts of things. And the, and the workshopping is, I, I have to say, of, of all the things, and, and I'm staying away from like the one most important thing, but you really, it's one of the, the most critical things for transforming the culture. Because until you get people working together and getting out of their silos and actually collaboratively designing together, it ain't never going to happen. You need sales and support, customer care, global and, and, and local, regional people all working together in the same room on a common problem to shift the culture so that we can get away from that that you know, scenario of, of people having different views of what the elephant is uh, to you know, one organization embracing the elephant. And then you get away from some of the, the uh, seven deadly sins of silos. So while we do try to like to stay positive, I do think sometimes it's important to point out the anti-patterns and the negative things that happen and the things that you want to avoid. If you, you don't point out things like ownership gaps or control conflict, process disconnect, false representation, finger pointing, redundancy, and hoarding, like if you don't if you can't transparently and adultly point those things out, it's really hard to isolate them and to use that as a motive to uh, to get beyond them and to be able to see when symptoms are coming up. So. Um, as a part of our workshops, we also you know, have created these guidebooks that really help facilitate people so they don't have to you know, always have everything that's just in their head. Um, anyway, so we, we have that as a tool. And at the end of our workshops, people are able to just answer these, um, you know, answer these seven questions in teams and come out with uh, at least straw man campaigns that then they can take into the later phase. So, that's a quick kind of overview of, of uh, some of the things that um, we've found to be essential enablers in transforming all culture, and um, I will leave it at that and hand it back to Jesse. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carlos, and thank you, Kyle. I, I mean, this has really been really informative, really deep stuff, uh, and I'll just let everyone know before jumping into Q&A that we will be uh, providing recording a, a, along with the slides of this webinar, so if you need to review any of this. Uh, it's a lot to take in, but uh, really valuable stuff. Uh, we will make that available to you. Um, real quickly, I just wanted to go into some questions. Uh, we have a few here. Uh, some are more strategic, some are a little more tactical, so I'll try to, my best to get to all of them. Um, this one's really for Kyle and uh, Carlos. You know, you've talked a lot about the content structure that you've created, your ability to get content to all these different markets across all these different teams. Uh, how do you maintain visibility uh, when it comes to content across all of those markets? How do, you, how do you know what's being made in, in a kind of real-time way um, and what's being produced, what's being distributed? How do you analyze it? I mean, how do you get that visibility? Um, I mean, I can, it's pretty easy for me, for us. It's, it's constant communication, number one, with marketing managers in each country. That's easier for me to say because we have – seven offices globally, right? It's a little bit different from Carlos. Within our Salesforce instance, we have a, uh, a software called Savo, S-A-V-O, that actually manages all of our um, sales type content for salespeople to search and get notifications on what's new. From a content management perspective and distribution, we use the post, of course, but Savo is that internal system that, that sales team uses to manage a lot of this content and to have visibility, um, and that's multilingual as well. Gotcha. How about you, Carlos? Yep. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I no, that's that's. Uh, I think that's about the right way to go about it. It's it's something we we struggle quite a bit with because, as I mentioned earlier, you know we have a marketing community of of around six thousand people or so, and so it's 
really hard to get um, visibility um, to all the things that are going on. So, but, so that's, that's really a, a work in progress for us as we're helping to um, uh, accelerate how uh, global and regional and locale level organizations work together um, to help them create visibility. And that's, you know, not to be, uh, uh, you know, for the poor audience to seem like I'm, you know, just doing a commercial for you guys. But that's, that's where um, platforms like what you guys deliver are, are, are very much key um, because you, you really need something that is going to tie together but, you know, in some sort of edit editorial calendar, some sort of kind of system that's tagging things that creates that visibility, and that's a gap that you know that we're we're closing uh, in that context. But it's without that kind of tool, it's almost impossible. And I didn't mean that as a commercial; it's just a <laughs> it's just a fact. You know? I'll take the endorsement. Yep, it's an endorsement. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, great, great. Uh, here's another one, and I, I think both of you spoke a little bit. Uh, to this, and I think you both kind of kind of got at it a bit, but um, put really directly by James here is, you know, how do you tailor your marketing to a local market? So how do you tailor that content to a, a particular region, a particular uh, location, while maintaining a kind of universal company-wide message? You know, how do you stay on message if you're spreading your content out? Well, I can. Uh, I'll go first on this one. Um, so that's that's uh, an initiative that we're you know that we're working on. Everybody is struggling with that one. You know, um, um, and the more global you are, and the more complex, and especially you know if you're a company that acquires a lot of other companies, that sort of brings along a special flavor as well. Um, but there, you know, we we do trainings and whatnot that that um, show, hey, you know, here's here's some corporate messaging. Now, how do you blend that? I think it's key to blend those exercises um, with localization and with customer targeting. I think one of the tricky balances and the thing that content marketing has really helped to elevate is hyper-targeting, right? You want to be super relevant as much down to the individual as possible. And that definitely throws a lot of the Mad Men era kind of notions of, of uh, uh, message dominance um, kind of throws that out the window or makes it really very challenging because if you're trying to appeal to, for example, you know, Latino automotive aftermarket people who are, you know, putting hydraulics in cars and whatnot, it's a very different audience from, you know, your sort of classic car collector, 1920s restorative type of person. And do you, you know, do you speak with the exact same voice to both? Or is there some way that you find that you can translate the principle of your messaging to those different people through um, language, through atmos through whatever it is that really makes sense and is relevant and isn't alienating to them? And so that's, uh, we have exercises that we do to try to achieve those things. It's a very, it's a very difficult balance, and I think it requires some, some very nuanced skills for communicators to do that. Yeah, and this is the way that I describe it is um, it's from Daniel Pink's book where he talks about the sales organization. There's the em there's the way to sell with empathy, and then there's a way to sell with perspective taking. Empathy is that high level vision that the company sets that is like win the hearts and minds of marketers, right? The em the perspective taking it taking side of it is cognitive and analytical. It's about understanding someone's interests and behaviors. And I think if you sell from an empathy where you're trying to understand someone's emotional state or feelings, you can sell with a very high-level overview of content. And that's where our primary research comes in. But if you want to sell from a perspective-taking side of it, which is the interests and behaviors, we, you know, from our, our perspective as a marketing technology company, it's like data sheets for our products or um, selling to a, um, to a consumer in um, Sao Paulo. So it's, it's understanding those two forms, um, and that's how we kind of look at it from a very high-level view. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, yep. This one's from Catherine. Um, it's a pretty interesting one. How do you allocate spend for content to the businesses, or does a lot of the budget from the content program come from corporate? So it's an interesting question. You know, how, how do you get – how do you allocate the spending? Where does it come from? Where is it found within the organization? Do you guys have any input on that? Well, I, my, ours is based off of pipe gen. Um, you know, I think the allocation of budget, we're working through this, right? It's, it's if 
a core group of people are, are producing the most pipe and sales for a company, budget allocation will shift based upon that. Um, and, that's, and that's really just the concept, at least within a smaller global organization mm -hmm. from the demand yeah. end side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in our case, it's really, it's really business level. I mean, we have corporate centers of excellence that create content, like our brand journalism and whatnot, but these, uh, the budgets tend to be department-centric, which is one of the reasons why you know, we're working hard to really help with the sharing and repurposing um, aspect of all this kind of stuff so we can really get the most out of, uh, uh, out of the content assets. Gotcha. All right, and then this is the last one I'll ask uh, from you guys, is, and I think it's from, uh, I think it's pronouncing this right, niche or niche. Uh, where in the content creation cycle do you think about creating multilingual assets? So I know, Kyle, you talked a lot about you know, all the different markets that you're getting this out to and that you do a lot of translation. Uh, and translation uh, services yeah. you probably tap, but you know where where in the development of any particular pillar are you starting to think about those particular local markets and the translation that you're going to need to do? Um, high level primary research, we always think of every market. When it gets to um, specific product related content, it's very much based off of campaigns brought down from product marketing. Because the way that we would write an email deliverable, a data sheet, is completely different in the UK as it is in the United States. So, you know, think of the think of the top level content, which is the top of the funnel, which is primary research. It's always multilingual. It's always based off of how do we produce content for every geo that we're in, and then the middle of the funnel is more um, more of the specific types of information, like does Germany need a legal document on email? Does Brazil need something about the World Cup? Right? It's very much based off of that kind of stuff. Yeah, in, in our case, as in many, um, because of how much we have going on at any given time, the answer to most things is usually all of the above, and it depends, right? So um, we – on the – there's, there's, for example, with some of our business groups, like in healthcare, you know, in things where there's a, content where there's a lot of local regulation, there tends to be a lot more country level independence because there needs to be, right? So a lot of times, what'll get produced in those context, in those contexts, are um, a minimal amount that really can be reused. Um, to the locale, so really like, for example, core product information and that type of thing. Um, what I'm trying to help the, you know, the organization do, and, on a, and, so, and then the, the, the next piece of it is kind of the, the opportunity basis, right? So you know, we'll have a situation where, um, and this is kind of where my role is as the, the, the free radical that flows between um, you know, various organizations comes in, I'm able to identify opportunities to link. So I may find a case where people in the U.S. are trying to do something that overlaps with something that people in Latin America are trying to do. And so in that case, I'll connect them, and then we start talking about, okay, well, what is local? What's global in this particular case, and how do those two things work together, and where are the savings and the overlap from either a research perspective or the asset perspective, and all of that type of thing? Great. Well, we're right up on the time, so uh, I just want to thank real quickly uh, everyone for coming out and, and listening. Um, like I said, we will distribute uh, to all of you who registered uh, or attended uh, today. Uh, this particular webinar, so you'll be able to review it, go over the slides in more in depth, and just take your time with it as well. Um, but I really want to thank Kyle and Carlos as well. Thank you both for giving us uh, access to your knowledge, to your experience. Um, it's a really thorny issue for a lot of marketers who are trying to adapt to this new content marketing-centric approach. Um, and I think having your past experience and your best practices uh, really helps. Uh, lastly, before I go, I just want to let everyone know um, if you are looking to get more visibility into your content uh, across all your regions, one of the key ways to do that is obviously to do a content audit, uh, to track down where all your content lives, who's using it, um, how it might have performed. Um, used to take months to do that. It can now take uh, a day. Um, so if you go to www.contentauditor.com, um, you can type in your URLs, and we will actually crawl all of that content and put it in a nice little database for you. Um, and that is 100% free. So don't worry, we won't charge you. Um, so go ahead and, and give it a shot, and I just want to let people know that that's available. 
Uh, once again, uh, this is Jesse Noyes from uh, Capost, and I want to thank again Kyle and Carlos uh, for their help today, and thank you all for your interest. We'll be talking to you soon.